leading into the deferred sales trust, which is the last and final part, the core of what we do, um, the core of what we're experts at, deferred sales trust, which is a tax strategy by which the seller of any highly appreciated asset uh, may sell that asset, defer the taxes owed for the year of sale, and they have flexible investment options. So um, we, you know, you see all this content on our website. You can hear us talk about this on a webinar every month. If you've spoken with us, you'll see us chanting this slogan every day. Um, but it, it really is that uh, clear. It really is that simple. Um, a few in terms of, you know, when people talk about limitations, you know, in our opinion and, and you know, call us bias, but uh, due to the unique advantage that we can serve any seller of any asset, we believe our strength is in our structure's flexibility with few restrictions, limitations. So um, in terms of any asset can be sold and investment classes, as long as it's a viable investment, um, a, a seller can invest there. So that's a lot more flexibility and control. And of course, Greg dive deeper, but, um, but that's, that's high level what we do. All right. Thank you, Paul. So, so, you know, last on our list today is the deferred sales trust. And, you know, again, this is the core of what's available to a given, you know, seller of an appreciated asset that's looking to mitigate the tax associated with selling that appreciated asset, right? 1031 exchanges are also among the list. It's just, I think that's fairly commonly known and we've done other webinars about 1031 exchanges and you know the pros and cons and the risk factors associated with 1031 so i just want to mention that it really is on the list but we're just not covering it today uh because we have done that before but just so you know we can answer questions about 1031 exchanges uh that you may have as well so uh, that being said there's not a lot out there uh, and deferred sales trusts is is one of these strategies that I, I tell a lot of people it's not new but it's new to a lot of people it actually has a deeper track record than opportunity zones for example um and, and similar track record in terms of uh time as a delaware statutory trust been around like 27 years now but because the deferred sales trust is highly specialized and niche um there are not dozens or hundreds or thousands of other tax attorneys or other firms trying to replicate uh, the, the deferred sales trust strategy. The main reason around that is because, you know, it takes years and years to get the IRS to sort of, you know, turn their head and pay attention and then want to dive in and do deep, deep level scrutiny. You know, they'll do, they'll do some audits, pick around the edges, and then at some point years down the road, they'll go directly to the uh, to the creators, the sponsors, or whoever is put together in, in our case, you know, our tax team um, and do deep dives and, uh, you know, go through years of transaction records. So they want you to build up a, a, a pretty deep case file because they want to review all of it and see if they have any problem with it. So that's what it would take for anybody to try to replicate this. And, and nobody to date really has, has done that. Or if they've tried to do a startup, they don't have the track record behind them with the IRS audits, reviews, et cetera. So anyway, just a quick background on the DST and, and for our purposes today, I, you know, I want to be pretty objective and I, I think I, hopefully I have been with regard to these strategies because, you know, they all have a place. They all have a place uh, for years. I have personally helped clients in each of these areas, Delaware's charitable trust planning and opportunity zones. And then for the last six years as a trustee for the deferred sales trust, you know, one of only 16 nationwide, um, I've, I've been able to add that into the repertoire and actually really specialize in this area because, you know, again, I'm trying to be objective, but I, I must say that, you know, the deferred sales trust is the greatest thing to happen since the invention of sliced bread. I, I mean, if I would have had this in my quiver of options when I'm trying to assist clients over the years, you know, my, you know, 30 you know, year experience, I would have been thrilled to have that in, in the mix. I did a lot of 1031 exchanges as a real estate professional for clients, things of that nature. I helped them exchange sometimes into Delaware statutory trust because they just couldn't find ideal replacement property, things of that nature. So, you know, but the deferred sales trust, you know, it's, it's core benefits are that it's legal proven and IRS tested, number one. Number two, it allows sellers of any kind of appreciated assets, business, real estate, personal residence or investment property, land, uh, any any kind, uh, cryptocurrency, collectibles like fine art, things of that nature, pretty much anything that can appreciate in value that you want to sell, 
that would be subject to a tax consequence. The DST is an appropriate vehicle for all of it. You know, some of these others, as we've gone down the list, they're very narrow. You know, Delaware's only real estate, you know, um, charitable remainder trust. You can sell various things, but you got limitations on what you can do after you sell it. Opportunity zones, you've got some core things that you can sell and put the money into opportunity zones. Primarily it's real estate businesses and stocks, but the deferred sales trust could be anything. I mean, we've had people selling jet jets that have gone up in value per private jets. We've had them sell Huge businesses. Catalogs. We've had them sell cryptocurrency, you know, a whole myriad of businesses, whole myriad of stuff. And so it allows those sellers to defer the capital gains taxes, control uh, the reinvestment of the funds without restriction or limitation. So some of these strategies have some limitations. Charitable trusts have some limitations. By de definition, Delaware's and opportunity zones are going to be focused in, you know, hard assets, real estate mostly. Okay, the first sales trust. You can be in equities. You can go back into uh, uh, real estate investments as an active or a passive uh, uh, investor. Um, you could invest in, you know, uh, do hard money lending. There's a there's there's really no restriction or limitation on what that can happen. And then you also can control um, your income and your tax benefits. So in every other strategy, there's going to be a sponsor and it's going to be a long term hold and they're going to make all the decisions, how much they're going to pay you, when they're going to sell, all of those, all of those factors, right? With the deferred sales trust, you actually have the, that control. So you're going to direct or approve how the trust invests the money. You're going to direct how much you want to be drawing on it uh, on a periodic basis. Um, you're going to determine if you want to cash out early and you can at any time, or you're going to determine how long you want it to run. And there's no limitation or a, a time limit where you have to cash out and pay your taxes. So it is it is a tax deferral strategy, as I said. So you're, you're basically electing, instead of taking all the money in the year of sale, you are electing to receive your proceeds plus an attractive rate of return over some period of time that you shall determine and, and negotiate with your trustee. And in doing so, you get to keep the tax money you otherwise would have paid in the year of sale, working directly for your benefit to generate more income for yourself, faster wealth accumulation, or maybe a combination of both. And you get to kind of set the parameters. And over time, if you need need or want to change how much you're drawing, or you know, some people just call it my income from my, my DST, um, that's flexible as well. So lump sums are available, changes in the income stream up or down, or even deferring it, you know, uh, to be resumed at a later date. That's a lot of the flexibility that is inherent in the uh, deferred sales trust uh, strategy. And, you know, obviously those who have uh, attended other webinars of ours, we, we've done some deep dives on, on various levels of the deferred sales trust. So I didn't really intend today to get too, too deep into the mix, but, but I did want to mention and just piggyback on something Paul said earlier, uh, which was a great point, is that sometimes <clears throat> clients are interested uh, or more favorably inclined to go the deferred sales trust route, but there may be a situation in their particular transaction where we have to combine the deferred sales trust with, for example, a Delaware statutory trust in order to fully defer all of the capital gains. And that particular scenario is really a mortgage over basis on real estate that you're selling probably occurred because you did a cash out refi along the way and then later on you're selling it and now your mortgage is higher than what your original cost basis is right Af and then after depreciation write-offs and so sometimes we can combine more than one structure to meet your goals and your needs um, the deferred sales trust also has the potential um you know with a kind of a companion strategy you know we have the dst the dst plus but if you've got a, a, a really large estate or you're selling a very you know large asset, could be 10 million or more, 20, 30 million, you know, folks in that in that zip code, they've got an estate tax problem. So our planning can also uh, include estate planning that moves a lot of these assets outside of your taxable estate for estate tax reasons, but still gives you the benefit of all the income for the rest of your life and the ability to pass it on to your designated uh, children or heirs.
uh, at your your choice. So um, that's a whole different webinar to talk about that in detail, which we will get to. But uh, having said that, Paul, uh, you want to you want to flip it to the other side, and maybe we can uh, see if anybody's got any questions. So. So this is just a little uh, compare and contrast um, uh, matrix, if you will. So we want to list all of the uh, the strategies we've talked about today at the cr across the top, and then some of the uh, benefits uh, uh, down the left. So, you know, tax deferral. You know, do you know do these strategies provide tax deferral? Yes, they do. Charitable remainder trust actually provides tax avoidance initially. Um, and things are taxable as they move forward. Uh, but yeah, tax deferral is available on every one of these strategies. Um, are each of these strategies IRS scrutinized and approved? Yes, they are, every single one of them. Um, what about flexible investment options? The only strategy that has flexible investment options is the Deferred Sales Trust. Now, granted, if you wanted to go into a Delaware or an Opportunity Zone, for example, you're going to be in typically you're going to be in real estate, you can pick the fund in the area and the location and the project you want to invest into. But after that, you know, it's not like you're going to diversify into other asset classes, which, you know, uh, hopefully you have other investments that do that if you go that direction. Now, the Charitable Remainder Trust does have flexible investment options. So I think, uh, you know, we need to turn that red X into a green uh, thing. But there are some limitations on the flexible investment options with the CRT. So. Uh, I'm just noticing that now, so something that we'll we'll modify, but know that that's the case. Um, what about can client modify distributions? Well, you cannot in the Delaware, the the CRT, or the Opportunity Zone because that's completely at the control of the sponsor. You know, the 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 group or the syndicated you've invested your money with. They will control all of those factors. They will try to give you an idea of what they expect. Things could change but they'll give you an idea of what to expect, but they will control all of those factors. With the uh, Deferred Sales Trust, you can modify, uh, working with your trustee to modify the level of distributions you choose to receive because there's no minimum or maximum. It could be, I want interest only related payments. I want a specific amount of money. I want, um, you know, just, uh, you know, I, I, I want to be earning six, seven, eight percent in total, but I only want to draw the equivalent of of three or four percent whatever so that i can experience income and growth at the same time in kind of a balanced approach um, uh, so that can work there uh, is there indefinite tax deferral um no i mean on the delaware no um ultimately when they sell the project you're going to get paid out that's just how that works charitable remainder trust um, um you get tax avoidance at the sale of the asset and after that Aside from the tax benefits we talked about, you know, there's no more tax deferral about because you avoided the taxes initially, but you'll pay taxes on, generally speaking, on all the earnings and all the income and stuff that you receive. At the end of the day, the charities get the money. They're a tax exempt organization, so they won't pay tax ultimately on the inheritance, even if there's capital gains built up inside of that. Uh, opportunity zones, same kind of thing as the Delaware. You know, when they finish the project and they can start selling it out, um, then you'll get paid out at that point in time. The DST, on the other hand, is completely up to you. You kind of control the length of time you want to keep this open. And it could it could theoretically pass through generations of your family as a legacy play if you wanted it to. Um, so you have control in the other strategies. Somebody else has control. And then, um, you know, uh, the final rule comparison is can each of these strategies be used with any type of asset sale? And the answer is um, n no. I mean, Delaware statutory trusts, if you're trying to d defer taxes, it means you're selling real estate and then using it as a 1031 play to go into that. Charitable remainder trusts, um, most assets you can utilize for a, a charitable remainder trust provided that you create the trust first you transfer ownership of the asset to the trust then you put the sign in the ground as, as we say and sell it and then you know operate forward as, as discussed so crts do have uh flexibility for a lot of asset classes to be used because you know the whole idea of the code is to give people incentive to donate to charities so that the government isn't responsible for taking care of everything in this world you know, we get some charitable organizations that probably do a better job 
quite honestly, than the government in, in serving local and community um, needs that are not otherwise provided for elsewhere, right? Opportunity zones, um, again, you, you, uh, you, can, uh, you can defer, um, you, you can use an opportunity to zone to defer various types of asset classes, again, primarily real estate, businesses, and stocks, but not necessarily everything under the sun. Um, so you do have flexibility there, but not, you know, if we use the term any, you know, any means all. Uh, deferred sales trust, pretty much anything, pretty much anything that you have appreciated in value can be sold. Now, there may be some limitations and some criteria on some of these things. We talked about an accredited investor status for a Delaware and for an opportunity zone, right? No real specific limitation on charitable remainder trust as far as the value or the amount of gains that you're trying to defer there's no real minimums there you know you just kind of have to look at the underlying you know fundamentals and financials of what you want this to do for you and whether it's worth going through that process and kind of tying your hands a little bit if it makes it worthwhile so it's really a personal choice there with the deferred sales trust really that's going to be appropriate if what you're selling or you know, if you have more than one asset that you're gonna be selling over you know, a relatively short period of time, uh, that the combined tax hit would otherwise be $100,000 or more combined, then the Deferred Sales Trust can be an effective and appropriate vehicle. But if what you're selling, and it's the only thing you're selling, and, it, and, and the tax result is gonna be, let's say $50,000 you know, at most, federal, state, um, and, and Obamacare tax, then the deferred sales trust might not be appropriate um, for you for that particular transaction, but maybe one of these others could be, right? So this is this is where you can kind of pivot and and, and why it's important, I think, to compare and, and contrast. So, uh, Paul, do we have any questions? Uh, here yeah, we got a few great questions, Greg. I think uh, you'll you'll like this one. So, uh, we'll start with Roma. She said, uh, "Opportunity zones include life insurance with cash benefits too." Um, life insurance with cash benefits. I'm not, Roma, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, typically, um, you know, typically life insurance is not an asset that ne you'll necessarily sell, um, you know, as the, as the springboard into a tax deferral strategy, because as we know, cash value life insurance by design, that is a tax deferred, uh, entity, right? But and then life insurance can't be the recipient of the sale of something that would would be subject to taxation. You know, in other words, I can't sell my building and roll it into a life insurance policy. You know, that's what's called. You know, there, there you know, we have 1031 exchanges for ex, you know uh, exchange of like kind real estate. We have a code section called 1035, which is the exchange of life insurance from one policy to the next. So if you have built up gains taxi for gains in a life insurance policy and you want to exchange it into a different life insurance policy and roll it all over into a different carrier or a different contract that's what's known as a 1035 um like kind of exchange insurance to insurance so um yeah if you if if Roma, if you want to clarify that if i didn't answer your question uh, please please do um what else we got paul we got uh steven great question actually uh, regarding opportunity zones, do the capital gain elimination after holding for 10 years only apply to the capital hard assets or does it encompass goodwill as well? Uh, it, it would encompass goodwill as, as well because goodwill, you know, goodwill is a term that's used in the sale process of your business, right? You know, allocating how much to goodwill, which is usually the lion's share, you know, how much is fixed assets like plant and equipment or trucks or machinery, stuff like that. That really is more how the allocation within your sale structure works. But, um, you know, since goodwill is deferrable uh, and it is subject to the capital gains, yeah. So your entire capital gains, including goodwill, um, is deferrable into the opportunity zone. And if you, uh, although you will have to pay taxes though, don't forget by 2026, you're still gonna have to pay taxes on, on the total capital gains, including goodwill by the end of 2026. But then on the new investment that you go into, you hold it at least you hold it 10 years or more, then whatever that asset grows to will be free from capital gains taxes. 100% excluded. Hopefully that helps. 
Yeah. Uh, Robert, uh, where is it regulated that a sophisticated, not accredited investor can invest in a Delaware statutory trust? Um, those are um, those are like SEC regulations. You know, I think it's probably codified into the IRS code as well. But uh, SEC and FINRA regulations require certain types of investments only be offered to um accredited investors and and it, it's sort of that minimum threshold you have to have at least a million dollars in assets aside from your home or you can have to demonstrate that you you know that on your tax returns that you make at least 250 to 350 thousand dollars a year for the last couple of years and the primary reason for that is whenever investment requires accredited investors um those assets are, are not going to be short term, nor are they going to be liquid. They're going to have to be maintained inside of that investment for some period of time, three years, four years, five years, 10 years. And so they don't want uh, they want they don't want sponsors taking money from people that that can't afford not to have that money back in a short period of time, you know, just don't have the resources in case of emergency, because if they're desperate, you're not going to be, be able to get your money out of this thing, unlike owning a mutual fund or something like that. You can liquidate that tomorrow. Yeah, okay. liquidity is huge. I think follow up to Robert, he asked, can't an owner of a Delaware statutory trust beneficial interest exchange for another DST Delaware statutory trust beneficial interest directly? If a DST Delaware statutory trust beneficial interest is placed into our structure deferred sales trust, can it be traded for another beneficial interest at the owner's discretion? um let's see if i understand that question so you can sell active real estate and exchange into a delaware you can exchange from a delaware into another delaware you can use the deferred sales trust at either of those junctures too so you could you know sell your active real estate and go right into a deferred sales trust you could have a delaware ownership where you probably exchange from something previously. So you still have all your built up capital gains inside of that. You could use the, the, the deferred sales trust um, to get out of the Delaware when it's gonna be sold and closed out. Uh, or you could have the option to do another 1031 exchange into another Delaware. So that's flexible. So Roma, appreciate that uh, for everyone who is here. Uh, we will be sending out a recording as well. So I know we've gone through a lot of information. Any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to us, 714-881-1362. Uh, Greg's email is greg at reefpointusa.com. My email is paul at reefpointusa.com. Uh, we are available to answer any follow-up questions. Um, if not, we'll be sending out the email with the follow-up link when it goes live. Um, and again, any questions anyone has, a comparison saying, hey, my client is very comfortable with Delaware's, which we currently have a real estate owner located here in Southern California. He has about 25 properties. He's been very comfortable with 1031s and Delaware's in the past. So for him, this was something new he wanted to explore. Um, and I think the, the, the difference in showing the flexibility, the investments, distributions, the estate planning part of it, um, how it can go to your children and, and they can continue the deferral if they wanted to. I think folks find a lot of value in that. So. Um, a lot of information. Great, great job, Greg. Um, and thanks for joining, guys. Any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Yeah, thank you, everybody. I realize, you know, the time that we spent here is quite a bit. So I really, you know, appreciate, you know, you taking the time to, uh, you know, learn with us and participate. So much appreciated. Uh, we'll try to make sure that some of our future webinars are a little bit shorter and more digestible. But there was a lot to cover today, so I really appreciate uh, your, your attention and your interest. So thanks, everybody. Have a great holidays. We'll talk to you uh, next time around. We'll see Bye you tomorrow. Now.